Hi everyone, welcome back to Chem Help ASAP. Now that you know and understand intermolecular forces, let's work some problems together. Our first problem here wants us to rationalize these different vapor pressures. Now remember, vapor pressure is defined as the pressure of a gas at equilibrium with the liquid phase. Now one way that I think about this is I think if I have a puddle of whatever substance I'm looking at, how quickly will that puddle evaporate? A high vapor pressure means that that puddle is going to evaporate very quickly. A low vapor pressure means it's going to take some time for that puddle to evaporate. So if I'm looking at my table here, um, I see my lowest vapor pressure is water. So my puddle of water is going to take the longest time to evaporate. Um, and my highest looks like butane. So if I had a puddle of butane, it would evaporate the fastest or the quickest. So now I have to explain why these differences occur. And of course, I'm going to use intermolecular forces. Now I know that the weaker the intermolecular force, the easier it will be for liquid phase molecules to move to the gas phase because they're just not held together very strongly. But if I have a very strong intermolecular force, then those molecules are going to be attracted strongly, which means it's going to have a tougher time moving to the gas phase. So let me look at my highest vapor pressure, butane. Well, if I look at my molecular formula here, I see that butane is just a pure hydrocarbon. It is nonpolar. If I have a nonpolar molecule, then my main intermolecular force is going to be the London dispersion force. As we know, London dispersion forces are fairly weak. Let's take a look at water. We have seen water so many times, we know that water has hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is one of our strongest intermolecular forces. Let's take a look at my two mid-range molecules here. What about ethanol first? Ethanol, I notice right away, has this oxygen-hydrogen bond. That means ethanol also has hydrogen bonding. Uh-oh, now I have two molecules with hydrogen bonding. Can I differentiate between them? The answer is yes. Water has two places where it can hydrogen bond. Ethanol simply has the one oxygen-hydrogen bond. Therefore, water is going to have stronger hydrogen bonding just because it has more places where it can experience that intermolecular force. So water with two sites for hydrogen bonding is going to be stronger than ethanol with only one site. Okay, the only molecule I haven't dealt with is diethyl ether. Here it's molecular formula. I can see we have oxygen carbon bonds going on, but no oxygen hydrogen bonds. So there's no hydrogen bonding. However, that oxygen is going to create a polar bond. So I have a polar molecule. If I have a polar molecule, my dominant intermolecular force is going to be dipole dipole. Okay, let's rank our molecules from strongest intermolecular force to weakest intermolecular force. Water clearly is number one. And then would come ethanol, and then between butane and diethyl ether, okay, polar molecule certainly comes before our nonpolar molecule. Does that match up with the trend we see in vapor pressure? So water, its vapor pressure is the lowest. 
That makes sense. It has the strongest intermolecular force. Those water molecules are going to hold tightly to each other in the liquid phase, and they're going to have a tough time going into the gas phase. Is ethanol my next highest vapor pressure? Yes, it is. Our trend is holding so far. Okay, let's take a look at diethyl ether. Is that our next vapor pressure? Yes, at 59 it is, which leaves butane as our weakest intermolecular force and our highest vapor pressure. So I find when answering questions about intermolecular forces, the first thing that I want to do is identify the dominant intermolecular force in each of the compounds. Then I like to rank them from strongest to weakest, and then I take a look at whatever physical property is given to me and see if I can match the trend of the strength of the intermolecular forces to the trend and physical properties. Remember, we are using general trends when predicting these physical properties, so keep in mind that there are always exceptions. However, it still is very useful, especially in the lab if you're synthesizing a molecule, to be able to predict if something is going to be a solid, liquid, or gas at room temperature. So even though we're using trends, it has a very practical application. I hope you found this video helpful and thanks so much for watching.